All right, as people are trickling in, we're going to um, play the final Ulysses on the clock, which is for Wandering Rocks. A one-legged sailor crushed himself round McConnell's corner, skirting Rabiotti's ice cream car, and jerked himself up Eccles Street. Towards Larry O'Rourke, in shirt sleeves in his doorway, he growled unamiably, For England! He swung himself violently forward past Katie and Booty Dedalus, halted and growled, Oh man, beauty! J.J. O'Malloy's white, careworn face was told that Mr. Lambert was in the warehouse with a visitor. A stout lady stopped, took her copper coin from her purse, and dropped it into the cap held out to her. The sailor grumbled thanks, glanced sourly at the unheeding windows, sank his head, and swung himself forward four strides. He halted and growled angrily, For England! Two barefoot urchins, sucking long licorice laces, halted near him, gaping in his stump with their yellow slobbered mouths. He swung himself forward in vigorous jerks, halted, lifted his head towards a window, and bayed deeply, Oh man, beauty! The gay, sweet chirping whistling within went on, a bar or two ceased. The blind of the window was drawn aside. A card, unfinished apartments, slipped from the sash and fell. A plump, bare, generous arm shone, was seen, held forth from a white petticoat bodice and tout shift straps. A woman's hand flung forth a coin over the area railings. It fell on the path. One of the urchins ran to it, picked it up, and dropped it into the minstrel's cap, saying, There, sir. What I like about this passage is that it demonstrates the way Wandering Rocks is a herky-jerk ballet. You've got fragmentation of movement, acts of charity alongside slyer dealings. You have a sailor with one leg, a disembodied arm, and snatches of song, everything broken into pieces. On the one hand, you can notice the um, physical disability is a pronounced theme in, in Ulysses. There are many characters who are blind or lame or deaf, missing some sort of ability. The word generous is a pun, because you get the generous arm, but also a generous view of a lady's arm. And we know that that lady is Molly Bloom, if we pay attention to the fact that we're on Eccles Street. There's another hint that tells us something about Molly Bloom. The song for England, Home and Beauty is actually a song about the death of Lord Nelson. That points us back to the one-handled adulterer, um, as Stephen called him. And that connects the one-legged sailor, the one-handed adulterer, Nelson, and Molly Bloom, the adulterer. Great. I hope you've enjoyed the Ulysses on the Clock episodes across the conference. And now it is my honor and delight to wrap up this conference's program by introducing our final speaker, Karen Tay Yamashita, who will present an illustrated essay, Cartographies of the Anthropocene. This comes from a longer collaborative in-progress work with her husband, Ronaldo Lopez de Olvera, Cannibal Catechesis, more specifically from the Manifesto Anthropocene, the title a reference to the Brazilian poet Oswald de Andrade's Manifesto Antropofágico, or Cannibalist Manifesto, which was published in 1928. As that signals, Yamashita's contribution to this conference comes to us by way of Brazilian modernism. Latin American aesthetics have informed much of her work, which has often been described as magical realist. Many of Yamashita's books blend fiction and nonfiction, text and illustration, and deploy an array of narrative forms, often experimental, in a way that manages to be simultaneously irreverent and matter of fact. I'm gonna give you some biographical facts in reverse chronological order to introduce our final plenary speaker. Karen Tay Yamashita is currently at work on a new novel, which takes as its central concern the Japanese-American loyalty questionnaire administered by the US government during World War II. In 2021, Yamashita was awarded its Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters by the National Book Foundation. Other recipients of this award for lifetime achievement include Toni Morrison, Stephen King, Maxine Hong Kingston, Don DeLillo, Ursula K. Le Guin, and Walter Mosley. In 2020, she published Sansei and Sensibility, a collection of short stories that explore Japanese-American identity across generations, Issei, Nisei, and Sansei, by riffing on Jane Austen. In 2018, she was awarded the John Dos Passos Award for Literature. 
In 2017 and 2018, Coffee House Press, Yamashita's publisher throughout her career, reissued four of her earlier novels in the style of her more recent publications, a very material publishing affirmation of a substantial body of work. In 2017, Coffee House Press brought out Yamashita's book of family history, Letters to Memory, which includes images of family records that she would place with her literary archive at the University of California, Santa Cruz, including records of her parents' internment at the Topaz camp during World War II. For this book, she won a second Association of Asian American Studies Book Award. In 2014, her collection, Anime Wong, Fictions of Performance, came out. In 2010, she published I Hotel, finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction, the uh, winner of the American Studies Book Award, and really just a slew of other awards. 2001 saw the release of the collection Circle K Cycles. The first edition of Topic of Orange came out from Coffee House Press in 1997. You can see the first edition displayed in the Mapping Fiction exhibition. Yamashita's husband, Ronaldo, painted the image of Los Angeles overlaid with an orange for the cover. An expansion of Ulysses' circadian structure, though not directly influenced by Joyce, Yamashita tells the story over seven days, her story over seven days from seven different characters' points of view, a structure clearly laid out in her chart-like table of contents for the book. In 1997, Yamashita began teaching at the University of California, Santa Cruz. There, she taught creative writing and in the departments of literature and critical race and ethnic studies. Over her years there, she would receive many commendations for teaching and service to the college community. She is currently Professor Emerita. Her second novel in 1992 was Brazil Maru. Her first novel, Through the Arc of the Rainforest, came out in 1990, inaugurating a long relationship with Coffee House Press. These novels are set in Brazil and informed by anthropological work she conducted there with Japanese immigrants to the country when she was in her 20s. In the 1980s and 1990s, Yamashita wrote and produced a number of dramatic works, including Hanakusa, an American Buto, Tokyo Carmen versus LA Carmen, and No Bozos, and worked at the Los Angeles radio station KCET. Yamashita attended Carleton College in Minnesota, where she studied English and Japanese contemporary literature. There, she developed an interest in anthropology that led to a fellowship in Brazil, where she resided for nine years and met where she met her future husband and frequent artistic collaborator, Ronaldo Lopez de Oliveira. Yamashita grew up in Los Angeles, where her parents moved when she was in, an infant. On January 8, 1951, Karen Te Yamashita was born in Oakland, California. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Oh my, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I take a breath. Okay. I want to thank Karen Lawrence, uh, Carl Nielsen, thank you for your introduction, that was lovely. Uh, Alice Sai, and your colleagues and staff at the Huntington, and thank you also Kevin uh, Detmar and Pomona College. Thank you for your invitation and your generous hospitality. Thank you, Karen Lawrence. Thankfully, Karen Lawrence invited me to this conference a year ago. Um, and I have had some time to think about why me? The beautiful thing about literary scholarship for me has been to learn from literary scholars. I'm kind of a, a scholar groupie. <laughs> uh, I, I've, I sat through everything uh, in this conference and um, I was so happy to do so. I had great pleasure. Thank you so much for your, um, your, your papers and talks. Um, so I have learned from you what in fact I have been writing, I guess. But to be offered a conversation uh, or a connection to James Joyce and to Ulysses is a very big honor. And um, I thank you all of you. Okay, let me put my glasses on. Oh, oh well, I won't do that. Um, I've named this talk Cartographies of the Anthropocene, Anthropocene being my word for the present Earth era, another mapping of geotime in which we humans find ourselves. 
And for the purposes of this conference, I want to triangulate three cartographies or perhaps kinds of labyrinths, Joyce's Dublin, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Los Angeles, California. Overlaid or underlaid is the fourth cartography, that of the great and disappearing Amazon rainforest. In 1975, I went to Sao Paulo, Brazil to study Japanese immigration to that country. In that year, I met Ronaldo Lopez de Oliveira, a young student studying architecture and philosophy. Ronaldo told me a story which I trans transcribed from his oral telling. I typed it into an old royal typewriter. It was a short story about a, a page and a half, and it was entitled Laranja. It began, depois da divisão das árvores sob o trópico de Capricornio, brotou uma laranjeira. After the partition of trees on the Tropic of Capricorn, there sprouted an orange tree. As it turns out, the Tropic of Capricorn runs right through the city of Sao Paulo, the largest city in the Americas with some 12 million people. Ronaldo's story was about an orange tree on the Tropic of Capricorn, and in particular, a particular orange which grows around the invisible line or thread of the tropic. The orange, as it tosses in the breeze, matures and falls from the tree, rocks the line of the tropic, and causes great and small havoc to the map and its geography, and subsequently to the lives of people in Sao Paulo. A few, a few years later, Ronaldo and I got married, and the story was forgotten. In the meantime, I settled in Sao Paulo with Ronaldo and started to raise a family and two children. Then one day we all immigrated from Sao Paulo to Los Angeles. <laughs> in Los Angeles, Ronaldo came to study architecture and I got a job as a secretary at the PBS television station KCET, then located at the edge of East Hollywood. I commuted daily over the Los Angeles freeways from Gardena to Hollywood, and in those days, the Thomas Guide was how we navigated LA. It was about this time that I asked Ronaldo if I could take his story, Laranja, and move it from the Tropic of Capricorn to the Tropic of Cancer, and eventually to Los Angeles. Bobby's on a roll. Something's taking him through some curves. If the cuz is back home channel surfing, this must be the barrio surfing. Next moment, he's in the woods. Holly, Brent, Ingle, and the West Woods. Then it's the beaches. Manhattan, Redondo, Huntington, Hermosa, Topanga, Seal, and Long. Then it's the parks. Echo, Le Mert, Griffith, Elysian, Monterey, and MacArthur. Then the hills, Beverly and Brolin. The saints, Monica, Bernardino, Anna, Gabriel, Pedro, Marino, and Fernando. The loss, Crescenta, Cañada, Habra, Mirada, and Puente. And the elves, Segundo and Monte. And finally, the big loss. <laughs> In preparation for this story, Ronaldo and I crossed the border at Tijuana and took a bus to Mazatlan to visit the Tropic of Cancer. In my imagination, the orange tree was planted there. And then we returned on a bus packed with people traveling north. This is the original painting of the cover art for my novel drawn by Ronaldo. What I imagined was that a laborer traveling north from Mazatlan would carry the orange with the Tropic of Cancer into Los Angeles, dragging with him the great skirts of the Mexican border and Central and South America, that is, everything south. And the words came immediately, speak English now. 
And the first wave came like a great flood behind him, showing their hands at the borders, ten working fingers, each time thousands. Having to show their fingers meant that they must enter with nothing in their hands, nothing but the hats to shade their foreheads, the sweat on their backs, the seeds in their pockets, the children in their wombs, the songs in their throats, the cockroach, the cockroach the cockroach. Customs officials chased after Arcangel. By the way, are you carrying any fresh fruit or vegetables? Arcangel yelled behind him, only three ears of corn and one lousy orange. As I said, I worked here where the Sunset and Hollywood Boulevards intersect at this television station for 13 years. And to be honest, it is also where I wrote my first three novels. Don't tell them. <laughs> By the time I was writing Tropic of Orange, it was not a secret. And folks would come in and ask if they could be in the book. <laughs> my wise friend and art director, John Retzek, would say, be careful what you ask for. And as we know from the annotated work of James Joyce, it's really wise to keep one's social distance from any author. <laughs> as the secretary in the engineering department, I was asked to learn to use Lotus. And now you know Lotus as Excel, but as oldies, it was Lotus. <laughs> the spreadsheet application for accounting, I actually uh, I quickly learned this amazing application created columns. And I quickly adapted this use of the spreadsheet and columns to write my novel, the story to be structured over one week with seven days and seven characters. Seven days across the top and seven characters down the side. Seven times seven equals 49 chapters. This became the basic map or cartography for the book, each character traveling across time and space and literary genres accordingly. As the character Manzanar Murakami understands, there are maps and there are maps and there are maps. The uncanny thing was that he could see all of them at once, filter some, pick them out like transparent windows, and place them even delicately and consecu consecutively in a complex grid of pattern, spatial discernment, body politic. Although one might have thought that this capacity to see was different from a musical one, it was really one and the same, for each of the maps was a layer of music, a clef, an instrument, a musical instruction, a change of measure, a coda. Tropic of Orange was published in 1997, now 25 years ago. When it was finally published, I don't believe anyone understood my experiment and no one in the day would even blurb it. It's become today, I suppose, a kind of textbook for LA. I have Coffee House Press to thank for keeping it in print all these years. To be asked to present today in connection to Joycean cartographies is to me an incredible moment I could never have imagined. Now I'd like to move forward and share some other mappings with you, which are also collaborations with Ronaldo and his art. And I also want to mention, knowing Joyce's obsession around the coincidence of dates, especially his own birth date, that Ronaldo's birthday is February 3rd, a day after Joyce's. <laughs> but more importantly, I want to link the modernist moment of Joyce and his generation of European and American writers to the modernist moment of Brazilian writers and to propose a fourth cartography set over the Amazon rainforest. 
In these past few days, we have extended the ideas of Joycean cartographies to explore not only the historic and mythical, but the post-colonial, immigrant, and diasporic movements that constitute the formation of urban environments. I would like now to also include indigenous space and the intersection with the global, planetary, and the cyber. In 1729, Irish writer Jonathan Swift wrote the satirical essay, A Modest Proposal, in which he proposed that the poor and hungry could sell and eat their babies. Within the text of the essay, Swift also noted the Topinambu, a Brazilian indigenous tribe said to practice cannibalism of learning to love our country wherein we differ even from the inhabitants of Topinambu. 1922 marks the commencement of the of Brazilian modernism and the, with the Semana de, de Arte Moderna, the week of modern art in Sao Paulo. During that week, coincidentally also February, a roundabout carnival, the artists, musicians, poets, and writers involved were booed and condemned by critics and the press. As you know, 1922 is also the year of the publication of Joyce's Ulysses. So it is on two sides of the Atlantic a century ago, literary and artistic provocations were in movement. A few years later, in 1928, one of the organizers of the Semana de Di Arte Moderna, Brazilian poet Oswaldo de Andrade published the Manifesto Antropofágico, the Cannibal Manifesto, in which he declared Brazilia's art, Brazil's artistic strength to be its ability to, and right to cannibalize other cultures. A famous line from Andrade's manifesto also references the Tupi the indigenous tribe known for cannibalism, to pee or not to pee? <laughs> that is the question. The Brazilians were, it seems, also contemplating Hamlet. One more note. As you know, tales of cannibalism are part of ancient mythology. In Homer's tale, the hero Odysseus, with a dozen ships, enters the bay off the, off the city of Telepolis where he and his men are attacked by the Lestragonians, cannibalistic giants. Odysseus escapes in one ship, but all others perish. Well, we assume these lost men were eaten. And in Joyce's Ulysses, in the chapter Lestragonians, Leopold Bloom at nude enters a dining establish of e establishment of eating men and is repulsed by their gluttony. So to begin with a modest proposal, a modest manifesto, o manifesto antropoceno. It is befitting to commemorate the 466 years since the Caete 8, Bishop Pedro Fernandez Sarginha and some 30 of his companions. What a feast! Clink glasses and make a hearty toast with vintage Bishop Sarginha Saúdji. When Pedro Alvarez Cabral discovered Brazil for the Portuguese on April 22, 1500. There were 11 million Indians in 2,000 tribes. In the next 100 years, 90% of these people were wiped out. For those who prefer the cocktail, the muddled balls of Cabral in lime and minty sugar doused in cachaça, ching ching. In 1541, in search of El Dorado, Francisco de Orellana discovered the Amazon River, traversing it from Iquitos on the Napo River to the Great Mouth on the Atlantic Ocean. For appetizers, commence with Francisco de Orellano's right ear wrapped in gold leaf and pickled with hints of guarana, cinnamon, and clove, and café. In 1515, 
1550, Hans Darden was taken prisoner by Jepo Wasu and El Kinder Midi of the Tupinampa, brought to the coastal village of Ubatuba and ritually prepared to be eaten. Additionally, a French pate of Hans Darden's left big toe and liver in a thin, carefully crafted tapioca crepe. In 1799, Alexander von Humboldt encountered on the Orinoco River two Amazon parrots who continued to speak the dead language of the extinct Maipure people. The first course might be a cabbage and manioc stew of the butt of Alexander von Humboldt. From 1848 to 1859, Henry Walter Bates explored the Amazon from the Tocatins River to the Tefe River in the upper Amazon, collecting 14,714 mostly in insect species, 8,000 of which were said to be previously unknown. An interlude to cleanse the palate, a sorbet of the lymph nodes of Henry Walter Bates laden with edible orchids. In 1911, Theodore Kochrunberg traveled from Manaus up the Rio Branco to Mount Roraima, documenting the legends of the Pemon people. In 1928, Mario de Andragi published the novel Makunaima, based on the stories lifted from Theodore Kochrunberg's ethnographic narratives. Second course, a spicy coconut and palm oil mukeka of the tender breast of Theodore Kochrunberg. Percy Harrison Fawcett disappeared in 1925 while traveling from Cuyaba and crossing the upper Xingu River on an expedition to discover the lost city of Zi. In 1915, the Kalapolo tribe returned what they believed to be Fawcett's bones to Orlando Villas Boas, who brought them home in a box to Sao Paulo. Accompany the mukeka with fluffy rice seasoned with peppery parts of Percy Harrison Fawcett. In 1955, Claude Levi Strauss published Tristis Tropics, an ethnographic analysis of the Amazonian people. For dessert, a banana creme brulee made with Claude Leffy Strauss's spit. The Amazon is not a multinational cyber e-commerce marketplace. The Amazon is not in the cloud. To finish, an aperitif of the distilled brains of Jeff Bezos accentuated with coconut beijinhos. The Amazon rainforest is the living archive of 300 million years of the Earth's genetic endowment. To paradise where saudade is eternal. At 3.2 million square miles, the biogeographic Amazon can tuck itself into the 3.7 million square miles that contain the USA, or it is 12 times the size of Texas. How tasty, tasty was my eco-tourist. In 2019, 310,000 10, acres of the Amazon, 172,000 soccer fields, were cleared, then burned in August, deforestation for agricultural conversion. Have you eaten your vegetable elite today? The Amazon's matrimony and sustainability is in the care of tribal people. Ay, que preguiça. Today, 300 to 400 indigenous tribes live in the Amazon, 50 of whom do not have contact with the outside world. The doctor recommends a settler colonoscopy every 50 years. For 400 years, starting from 1501, almost 5 million enslaved Africans were transported to Brazil. By the end of the 16th century, fugitives from slavery established Mocambo or Quilombo communities, many hidden 
in the Amazon. French Revolution tomorrow, human rights for happiness the day before yesterday. Brazil was the last country in the Americas to abolish slavery, which it did in 1888. Eat, drink, and be carnival for tomorrow. 3,000 contemporary quilombos have been officially recognized since 1988, although half lacked land titles. They are spread over 50 million acres, mostly in the Amazon. Recycling what goes in must come out. Life in the Amazon's trees exists in five stories, floor, shrub, understory, canopy, overstory, each layer comprising a unique plant and animal ecosystem. There is no sin below the equator. Technology must be employed to protect and preserve the unique Amazonian environment, to continue the study of its complex ecological systems, and to discover its rich and still unknown biomedical resources. You eat, therefore you are. To preserve the Amazon, the vast ecosystem, and its inhabitants, the Earth's largest gaming reserve will be established. Deforestation for cattle, sugar, and soy production will be permitted only outside the perimeters of the Amazon. While this may result in scarcity of beef, ethanol, and tofu, the price of these commodities will rise. Dieting for a small planet. Timber oil and mineral extraction will cease within the boundaries of the Amazon. In exchange, Brazil will garner IMF bartering credits calculated to match, match losses amounting to trillions of dollars. The rest of the planet will pay Brazil for the pre precious oxygen expelled by the capacious lungs of the Amazon. Breathe in. Breathe out, unite the mind with air. A no-fly zone must be adopted to preserve the purity of the area and to prohibit all outside contact. In addition to electronic fencing, satellite sensor technologies will be employed to secure the border, conduct surveillance, and to collect data. As the Amazon biome is the single major preserve of Brazil, its security will depend on the strict coordination of and enforcement by the country's Army, Navy, and Air Force. Capitalizing on the eternal prosperity of humanity. A return to free nomadic living over a great expanse of preserved land area will promote exercise and greater health. Higher worth will be given to pure indigenous non-contact peoples. Toward the preservation of African cultures and histories of the enslaved. The primary concern will be to produce a highly organic and pure native food source. DNA testing can substantiate the purity of the species. Sex or food, food or sex, you choose. Careful calibration of age, sex, weight, and body mass will involve a qualified team of doctors and researchers. Optimal preservation of healthy bodies within a natural and original environment will create the most excellent model of health care on Earth. Toward the preservation of indigenous cultures, Embedded chip technology may not disturb or interfere with body art, such as tattoos or piercings. A commission of researchers will convene yearly to decide on the appropriate hunting season, number and selection of Amazonians for eating. Strict regulations about how to hunt will be enforced. For example, no firearms will be allowed, only primitive methods 
arrows, spears, darts, knives. Any traps must be pre-approved. Save Indians by making them Indians again. The kill must be clean so as to preserve the integrity of the meat. Michelin star chefs will compete to craft the most sophisticated recipes. However, only 10% of these recipes may be based on foreign influences. Defining a cuisine original to the Amazon, initiating a study of Amazonian food sources. Eat everything before you die. The rich matrimony of Amazonian plant life, fruits, roots, fungi, bulbs, palm, flowers, etc., and animal life, fish, birds, reptiles, monkeys, tapirs, etc., as well as their hallucinogenic and medicinal properties, should afford new avenues of culinary pleasure. Save the Amazon. Eat the noble savage. Signed, Washington Chateaubriand Silva in the 466th year of the eating of Bishop Pedro Fernandez Sarginha. Now journeying away from a cartography of the modern world in 1922, we share a little fabula. But first, a brief disclaimer. A parrot told me the following fabula. This parrot claimed to be the descendant of two Amazon parrots discovered by Alexander von Humboldt in 1799 who continued to speak the dead language of the extinct Maipure people. I calculate my parrot informant to be of the fifth generation of this illustrious couple. Of the pair, one parrot, was left behind in Brazil, a single parrot. She continued to nurture her young brood on the abundance of the forest, cacao, macuba, acai, sapoti, Brazil nuts. Mm. Meanwhile, her partner was sent away to Prussia to be studied. Van Humboldt, a naturalist, must have known that parrots are monogamous, tied to each other for life, but no, it was determined that the talkative one, which turned out to be the male, should be studied. The blabbermouth was sent away, a dead language captured in his feathered body. However, in fact, the parrot couple were having a conversation, one completing the thoughts of the other. I later discovered that the silent response of the female was quite simply ironic, as if she were rolling her eyes to demonstrate her disgust or incredulity. In the meantime, her male companion pratted on self-importantly. After all, he would be the one chosen for a future in Europe. To know the entire story requires both sides, two memories fused into one. Admittedly, despite faithful transmission over five parrot generations, I have worked with this disadvantage. But after years of careful and intimate study, I have been able to interpret one half of an extinct language and therefore one half of the story. What happened to the other European half? I can only speculate. But I am told that the deciphering of the captured males, male parrots' babble was undoubtedly the foundation for the structural linguistic theories of Ferdinand de Saussure. One imagines that the solitary mate, male parrot died piteously in some dank asylum in Konigsberg, squawking unintelligible histrionics. However, his stuffed body, gloriously red-crowned noggin and emerald feathers, is today displayed regally in the Museum für Natukun in Berlin. Admittedly, my original plans were to rediscover on the Brazilian coast the location of Uatibi, where Hans Dutton was captive to the cannibal Topininken in 1550. When I arrived, Uatibi had been transformed into a tropical hotel resort. Turquoise waves tipped in frothy spume, 
tickling, pristine and bleached sands, bikinied and speedoed bronze bodies rising from tepid water in slow, liquid motion, uh, unable to pay the exorbitant resort prices and not having anticipated a package deal. I ventured on foot up to an altitude of 15 100 meters above sea level to the Mata Atlantica, where I fortuitously met the parrot. Living in a thatched hut, tucked within a hidden valley of flowering ipe and the affluence of seven natural springs and protected by raucous hives of African bees, I communed with the parrot for the next decade. Indulging in the providence of the forest, mango, banana, guava, cajou, amidst the wafting stink of rotting fruit, the result of our exchange follows. As I eventually discerned from careful listening, the parrot was performing a dialogue, her half of the story. What I have recuperated here is, of course, speculative, however, confirmed by the parrot herself. That is to say, she would only continue her dialogue with me if my responses were, in her keen discernment, passable. I am entirely indebted to the parrot's patient and repetitive instruction and fully acknowledge my own incompetence. I have endeavored to translate as fully as possible her story and any errors are mine alone. Respectively signed, Washington, Chateaubriand, Silva. And now for the fabula of M. Boitata. Deep in the dark virgin forest, no fundo da floresta virgem e escura, mother tongue met father penis, my lingua conheceu pai penis. Mother tongue filled the forest with laughing chatter and gutturals, my lingua encheu a floresta com as falas animadas, risos e sons culturais. Father Penis, deaf and dun, dumb, slithered around and around, doodly nonsense on the loamy earth, leaving a wake of slime on everything, foliage, butterfly, sloth, fungus, stone. By penis, surdo e mudo, serpenteava em círculos, fazendo desenhos sem sentido na terra, argilosa, deixando um rastro de tudo em todo. Folhagem, borboleta, preguiça, fungo, pedra. Mother tongue savored everything. Foliage, butterfly, sloth, fungus, stone. She crooned and conjectured. What was that additional slimy taste? Hungry and to light the way, Father Penis ate the eyes of everything. Monkey, cicada, frog. Tucan, potato. Mother tongue, sightless, heard their cries filled with eyeballs. Father penis became a long, luminous sausage, but blinded, what good is light? Water dripped to stone, drip, drip, drip. A água pingava na pedra, pinga, 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 ta ta, ta ta, ta ta. Stone opened a space to water. This took a long time. But what is time? Time is work. Oh, what is work? I'm a parrot, how should I know? Lazy creature. Days, weeks, months, years, sun days, moon days, rain and flood, dry and rain, ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta. Water impressed its translucent liquid into stone. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Beju, beju, beju. Ay, what boring allegorical foreplay. Get on with it. Okay, okay, but first, a tiny cradle, a hammock, a lover's nest had to be made. A stone basin? Minimalist and natural. Uncomfortable, but so zen. Father Penis slithered into that stone indentation, a kaleidoscope of shimmering color cascading from above, a beautiful, haunting sight worthy of the colored pen of Paul Clay. That? The luminous dick? Aquilo, o pão luminoso? Meanwhile, Mother Tongue wandered toward the liquid sound. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta. Parched, 
she thrust herself into the mellifluous cataract, and that was that. What? Mother tongue and father penis played in their stone nest. Ah, ah, hmm, 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 ah, 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 ah. Water and slime, light and sound, M plus boy divided by tata equals M boy tata. The birth of our hero. O nascimento de nosso herói. Correction, hero X, like Latin X. Like sex. True, this naturally camouflaged child of the forest and boy Tata had a black penis and green breasts, although those little titties would appear much later. Double jointed appendages that embrace forward and behind, as well as swivel feet pointing forward and back. Baby M boy Tata straddled mother tongues back, their little penis wiggling behind, seu pequeno penis se sacudindo atrás. A tiny angel attentive to a receding world, um anjinho atento a um mundo que retrocedia. When Father Penis commanded, follow me, M boy Tata obeyed the direction of their swiveling feet losing the way in circles, impossible to track. I thought Father Penis was deaf and dumb. Ah, but he gesticulated in queer penis sign language. And Amboy Tata, uh, apart for, from or perhaps aided by an eccentric physique, a robust child, super functional, the birth of song and storytelling, a origem da música e da contação de histórias. Oh, another one of those predictable creation myths. M. Boy Tata was a prodigy. M. Boy Tata era um prodígio, of course. Spoke in full sentences and complex algorithms at three months. Sang opera in seven languages, anticipating on harmonica the haunting repetitive compositions of Villa Lobos and Philip Glass. Interviewed the virgin forest and memorized her memoir. Entrevistó a Floresta Virgen y decoró suas memorias. Recreated the Last Supper of Bishop Sarginha and his 30 companions in a mural, intricately employing 100,000 feathers of 1,300 species of tropical birds. The mural was ephemeral. O mural foi ephemeral. The feathers blew away in a hurricane. What a beautiful sight! All those feathers flying into the atmosphere for one last time. Hey, there are no hurricanes in Brazil. Okay, the mural along with 20 million objects, the archaeological repository of the South American continent, was destroyed when the National Museum inside Quinta da Boa Vista in Rio de Janeiro burned to the ground. You lie. Mentira. What does it matter? True, except for us, all those birds are dead or extinct. Ai. Que saudades. Ai. Que Preguiça. That's enough. Thank you.
Excellent. Um, are there any questions or reactions to Karen T. Yamashita's presentation? Uh, Karen, what do you um, see as the next step for this presentation? What would you... <laughs> thank you for it. And um, what is the... What is... Uh, have you performed it? Will you be performing it? Um, how do you see this mapping, this additional cartography? Um, being, how, how would you like to see it used? Oh, any way you like, Karen. Just, I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, yeah, I wrote it as a provocation a few years ago, and it was presented um, at a conference uh, on Flusser, Phil and Flusser, in Berlin. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what I was doing then, and I was a little afraid to present it. And um, I would have ended at the manifesto, but I thought that's, that was a hard place to end, so they, I softened it with a little bit of the fabula. The fabula is actually longer, and um, I think it does, the, uh, it does what the manifesto cannot do, which is to tell story. Um, so maybe I would just do the fabula instead. Both of these pieces have been published, uh, the manifesto was published in a, an edition of McSweeney's, edited by Valeria Luiselli. So if you want to look at it, it's there. And uh, M. Boy Tata was recently published in an online journal um, at USC called Air Light. And so you, there you could see the entire um, fabula, the fable. But uh, yeah, I don't know what. I think maybe I'm, I'm thinking that maybe this is my own provocation, and I'm asking you to, yeah, to, to take the next step. I don't know what that is. It's hard to do justice to that wonderful piece, having just experienced it. Um, I really love how you um, resist a kind of totalization, even as, you know, say in the manifesto, you're bringing in every um, good intention and turning it into something to be consumed, you know, making fun of it, eating it again, and uh, juxtaposing it with a kind of um, consumerism, or making it mm -hmm. into an instance of consumerism, mm -hmm. and then this fabula at the end just turns it all upside down again. And I feel like this is very Joycean, this uh, kind of smorgasbord of formerly inventive pieces that um, all of which have a really beautiful material quality. Um, the sound of your voice, the beautiful images, that adds up to a kind of joyful gift, even as there's a kind of profound political question, or even statement, a very negative, almost a, a really negative one, mm. at the heart of it. So mm -hmm. that kind of paradox is, would you like to talk about that? I'm so brain dead now. <laughs> Who promised me that they would answer the questions for me? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I didn't, you know, as I was writing it and I was thinking about it, I didn't know it would end that way. And I was rather shocked by the ending myself. And then I didn't know what to do. Um, and then, of course, preparing this as a, as something for you to see visually and not just read. Um, I wanted to layer on the bad maps, you know, <laughs> that, and I just wanted to put them out there I, because the mapping, the Google mapping of our world is, is extreme. I, I can uh, look at my home in, in Brazil the farm where we live, and I can see it on the Google map. I mean, I can see details of the front of the house and all of that, and I, it's, it's wonderful, but it's also very shocking. So we have been entirely mapped by a cyberspace, so then the cartography we have not talked about, the bad map we haven't talked about, 
is, is, is something far greater and, and we cannot control. Yeah. Yes, um, we have a question from our virtual audience. Uh, Natalie asks, how do you work with your partner, husband, and his artwork and his creative process? It's completely separate. <laughs> um, you, okay, so originally when um, I had the project, uh, someone asked for um, graphic material or, you know, because I usually I present and I said, I, you know, I steal everything from the, uh, the internet to show you. And obviously that can't be published. So I, I went to Renal and I said, what do you got? <laughs> and he said, oh, you want this? I go, oh, yeah, thanks. And I would just, I took a pile of, of his art and then reproduced it. So um, the, the collaboration I've had with Ronaldo is Ronaldo every night or all the time, he has some story that's working in his mind. And he tells it orally. So... The story about the orange was originally an, a, a little thing he talked about um, over dinner. And uh, I really didn't understand it and I wrote it down. Um, so many times there are ideas that he speaks about and um, I don't know where they come from. Um, and, and I, so that's maybe the collaboration. It's less with his art, but with our conversations over dinner. Uh, unfairly asking you to explain the joke, or as Joycean's would say, to unpack the portmanteau word, but anthropocene, um, you know, I hear throbbing, uh, the obscene, um, that which is unrepresentable. I wonder if you might talk a bit about how you want that deformation of the anthropocene to maybe knock our ideas about the Anthropocene out of their orbit or give them a different tilt? Well, I first heard the term mentioned uh, in a talk by Donna Haraway. And uh, so Donna Haraway made it evident to, uh, in a lecture, and I thought, she's right. Why are we going to have to call this next Earth era the Anthropocene? And um, we've, yeah, it's very troubling that we humans have destroyed, we were the next thing, we're the dinosaurs that are about to fail. Um, and so I wanted to have another word for it, and it was obscene to me. So well, that's simply it, it's playing with words. But I think it works. Is, is what's obscene the phenomenon that we are, we're describing by the word Anthropocene, or is it the word Anthropocene and, and sort of its, its baggage? Because there's, you know, raging debate about whether that's the right term. Oh, yes, yeah. and is it the right term? Yeah. yeah. Do we really want to name it after us? Yeah. Which of us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you figure it out. I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> I think we have time for one final question, if there is one more. Hi. Um, at first, I was like really just taken aback. And then it sort of slowly started to make its way uh, from a different door. Um, you're talking about cannibals. Can you go into that? Like the interest in cannibals in regards to the peace? Oh, um, it, it's, it has to do with a uh, Brazilian um, movement, for uh, a cannibalist movement. It, 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 and it began uh, as a modernist movement in, in Brazil to declare a national culture and art. And um, Brazil has, was well associated with cannibalism, that its indigenous tribes were known to be cannibals, 
or at least. And, you know, Jonathan Swift wrote about it. So it was something that was um, written about and thought about um, in the European world. So looking at Brazil, Brazil thought there was this idea as a nation that they were a cannibalistic people. And yet, up until that moment uh, of the Semana de Arte Moderna, um, Brazil looked to, uh, as its cultural exemplars, the Europe, and in particular France and uh, England. So they, uh, so the Andrades and the artists in Brazil, it was a nationalist moment in which they wanted to capture something that was their own culture. And so the, the Manifesto Antropofagico that was written by Oswald de Andrade is a statement of how Brazil can um, formulate its own national art um, and literature. And they, the idea of using the, um, of, of, of using cannibalism as a, as a way uh, to assert it. In other words, we can cannibalize anything and it will become ours. If we eat it, ingest it, whatever we spit out will be, you know, the new Brazil. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I specifically <laughs> thought it was interesting because um, usually notions of human and humanity are contrasted by savagery and when we think of savagery we think of cannibals and it's interesting that it tied up to this sort of oral story and uh, all of the story just about eating and um, yeah I just thought it was really interesting. So. Well you know I'm not an expert on it and, and so there if there's a Brazilianist in here you can really help help me out with it but this is what I understand, and so that this is what I, you know, I cannibalized. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Thank you. Well, in some ways, it would be nice to go directly from this discussion of cannibalism to our reception. <laughs> um, we're going to close with some closing remarks by Huntington President Karen Lawrence. There's no way to sum up in closing remarks this remarkable uh, conference. So I'm, I'm really not going to try. Um, thank you, Karen Te Yamashita. Thank you for all of you for um, wonderful panels beyond the dreams of the program committee. The first thing I want to do is to invite you all back to our anti-cartographic map conference, February 2nd, 21-22. We'll all be here um, to, see, to see what we're talking about and with uh, the maps that we create. But we, as I said the first, um, at our first meeting, that we were inspired for this conference um, it began with the inspiration of the 100-year celebration of uh, Ulysses and David Lilburn's gorgeous set of prints that the Huntington uh, had acquired and the wonderful exhibition where you can see them nearby in our uh, library exhibition, Mapping Fiction, that Carla Nielsen has curated. And from that, we mapped out a program with um, some uh, of the most interesting work being done in Joy Studies today, but really couldn't predict how that would cohere, whether it would cohere. So I just wanna say, um, really beyond our, our ideas of this, um, the tributaries, uh, there are all sorts of metaphors that I wanna use for how that inspiration may be breath and circulation how, um, how one paper almost uh, seemed to inspire another, and the dialogue the same way, ending with a performance that, I'm, um, that, that will echo and that will need to 
I don't want to say digest, but I, that I, <laughs> that will continue, um, really to continue to seriously reverberate um, all of these papers that we've heard. Uh, I want to thank our virtual audience. Somebody asked me if we were, if this was a living, live streaming of consciousness, um, which I thought was uh, pretty appropriate. Um, Moretti has written about maps that they're not explanations. Um, and I think that's true. They're models uh, for their tools for looking at hidden patterns. They're tools both to control and to resist. These are themes that have echoed and we continue to ask them in different ways, I think, throughout the last two days. So now I wanna thank people because there are many people uh, to thank. Our participants, I wanna thank our program Chairs, Kevin Detmer, Colleen Jurecci, sorry for pronounce, mispronouncing your name for, uh, for too long, uh, Carla Nielsen, and special shout out as we've been doing to Alice Sai, um, who is the Director of Special Projects and Institutional Planning, and I should have mentioned earlier that Alice has her PhD in English from the University of Michigan, so if you're gonna have somebody help you with organizing everything in a Joyce conference, that's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful person to have. So to, uh, first, I'd love a round of applause for our <laughs> organizers. But you have no idea how many people are involved uh, in this. And I'd like to um, just read some names. This is not gonna be like the Academy Awards, but we had um, a number of you said uh, how well things ran and, and um, how well taken care of you felt. This is for the live audience. I hope the virtual one did too. I, I, uh, and I'm gonna add those folks who helped with that. So um, our research division, Steve Hindle, um, thank you so much for all that you did uh, and, all, and our collaboration. Juan Gomez, Catherine Wary Miller, and Gloria Cox are a volunteer telling us how to stay on time. Uh, IT and AV, Heather Hart, who's the director of uh, technology here who was helping us with a conference, making sure everything worked out. Ben T Tuttle, who's the voice of God for the video for the virtual folks, Chris Min and our IT team. Special events, Vanessa Yu and Kimmy Feeney. Advancement, Amanda Greenberger, Hallie Prater, Gabby Kester, Jada Snow, Phoenix Rodman, Talene Romaya, Emily Goldblatt. Botanical, the great language of flower walk, Nicole Cavender, our director. Tom Carruth, Philip Bloom, Tim Tebow, Robert Horry, Danny Rudine. And we filmed, uh, as you saw, a, um, a number of events, Chris Springhorn, Zia Iampietro. That's it, we would love um, to, to uh, thank you all for coming and um, we'll repair out to our Rose Hills Garden Court Thank you to our uh, registrants from, for the seminar. I hope that um, you learned something and you really enjoyed hearing about Joyce from this. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>